Up next, we have Steve Jansen from McKinsey. He's going to be talking about secrets management in an immutable world. Um, he's going to get his laptop set up, and I'm just going to keep talking for a second. <laughs> cool. Thank you, Steve. Good luck. Hey, everybody. Uh, so, uh, Steve Jansen here. I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. I work for a management consulting company named McKinsey & Company. Um, you're probably wondering what is a management consulting company doing uh, talking at a very awesome tech conference like this. Uh, so I work with a practice called Digital McKinsey. Uh, Digital McKinsey has been a large investment uh, in our world to help companies figure out, you know, how do I reinvent my business and how do I start engaging in new ways with the, uh, you know, the existing sort of incumbent status that I have? How can I rethink how I'm doing my core business? I may be an incumbent. A bank is a great example. So you have someone like Capital One that really went to rethink, like, what's the world of banking in the future? Um, and then saying, you know, to empower those things and how I engage with my customers, um, how do I adopt things like Agile, right? So most large companies are very good at what they, they've done for many decades, but they're generally rooted in practices like Waterfall, where um, they're very optimized for stability, and they're seeing challenges when they're facing disruption about how do I move faster, how do I innovate more? Um, and so our story here today is part of our own transformation, where how does a large 90 plus year old consulting company reinvent itself uh, to do something like digital, right? If we're gonna help our clients on that, we have to do it for ourselves. So uh, McKinsey was very bold in this and saw this as being a large opportunity for many industries. And so we invested quite a bit. Uh, I joined as about the 15th person uh, about five years ago. We now have over uh, 1,000, I think it's closer to 1,100 now in our labs group. Uh, and then Digital McKinsey, the larger practice I'm part of, is about 3,000 people. And that's been a mix of people who are full stack developers, uh, agile coaches, UI, UX engineers, cybersecurity experts. Um, and we've done this at scale. So you know, this is not something we're trying to do in small numbers. We've had, in the last three years, over 1,000 different clients we've served on digital. Uh, we're in 60 countries. We're regularly uh, quoted by some of the world's leading publications on what our position is on digital. Um, and a lot of this growth is thanks to very significant investment, uh, including inorganic growth, where we've acquired a number of uh, best-in-class companies, particularly in the UI and UX design world and analytics. Um, so as, as we're doing this, uh, I think it's important to know that uh, McKinsey is very interesting. I feel very blessed to work there. Uh, our culture is all about ethics and values. We take that very, very seriously. And there's three values in our sort of core set here. And this is something we truly live every day. Like we call back to our set of values regularly in conversation. Uh, and so preserving client confidence, uh, building enduring relationships based on trust, those go hand in hand, and then governing ourselves as sort of one uh, firm. And that's important because we're a very flat organization, so it's, time, it's possible to do things in silos, but we try to pull ourselves back together in doing things um, as one firm. So why does this matter? Well, so we add a whole bunch of new profiles, people who are not uh, traditionally uh, MBA students who are then graduating and going on to work at a, at a management consulting firm. So what feels different about when you have a very different culture joining a very mature organization? I'm sure banks that are going through digital transformation feel this as much. Um, so testing and learning is very different um, from traditional IPT in a large company, right? So, you know, when I first joined, you go through a very awesome IT group that does their job very well. They have their objectives, they hit them well. It's usually around keeping email up and running and having a mobile workforce. And then you want to onboard something with them. And you're like, hey, just like we heard before with Jeff, <coughs> spin something. Sorry, that was me. <laughs> I'm, I'm we need to spin something up. Uh, and so they're like, great, you know, go through the governance here to bring something up for three years. And you're like, just kidding, I needed it for three hours. Uh, and then that kind of feeds into the next part where we're seeing a different challenge around cycle time. Um, so, you know, again, uh, organization optimized for stability, they want to make sure they've got all the th right things in place that's on just on a different time span. Uh, and then the last part is tools of the trade. You know, for most management consultants, they're going to work very comfortably in Excel, in PowerPoint, in email, and their Blackberry. It's very different when you bring in developers or you bring in designers. They're going to have a very different set of tools, like GitHub. This is going to be a very foreign concept to a place that's used to a different set of tools. So, you know, as we're trying to figure out how to go faster, we're like, how do we bring in agility? And this is really the key problem that most large companies are facing. How do we bring in agility without cannibalizing what we're already good at? You know, I mean, don't get it wrong. I mean, most large companies are very good and they're there for a reason. And they know that they want to innovate faster. They know they're facing threats from smaller, more nimble places that might be startups or uh, might be coming in from a different industry. But they still have things they do well. And so how do we keep doing that and add agility into it? And so the task I was really uh, faced uh, to solve was, uh, you know, how do we do something like public cloud, where traditionally we would have said, you know, that's scary. Uh, we don't feel like we can trust that. 
So how do we do that in a way that's not going to possibly either jeopardize our core IT mission or jeopardize the confidence of our clients? And so, you know, really for us it was very simple, it was dog fooding. So we go to clients and we talk quite regularly about this concept of two-speed IT, and here's a quote from Apple Computer in its early days which said, hey, if we think that word processing and spreadsheets are the right answers for people to use on an Apple computer, we should use it in our own office, so don't buy typewriters anymore. So mine was more or less the same thing. We go to clients and we say, hey, there's this concept called two-speed IT. You can debate the merits if that's where you want to be long term and say you've got one speed that's optimized for stability and one that's optimized for agility. Maybe that's not where you want to be long term. Maybe you want to be a really awesome, agile practitioner like you hear Capital One about all the time as a case study who's cloud native. Um, but in this case, it's a great way to get there, right? You've got to start somewhere if you're thinking an agile mindset. So we said two speed IT, you know, my practice is not concerned with running our core email systems. We're thinking about how do we engage with our clients so we can probably get our toe in the water and start embracing things like public cloud. So we're going to start migrating some of our client-facing stuff to that, and all the greenfield stuff goes to cloud. But we hit a lot of hurdles along this way. You know, it's AWS, right? You should be able to go into the console, to hit some knobs and buttons, everything comes to life. So we hit some interesting things, particularly with risk and security. So data at rest and service providers. So we went through many, many months of conversations around encryption key management. And then we're used to a world where we have, like our clients, very complicated firewall rules. So the mentioned before about edge firewall rules, I heard of one company recently had millions of firewall rules at the edge, right? Like they have a lot of maturity in that. They trust them very deeply. How do we go to a world where, you know, you don't have that anymore, the castles and moats, the castle walls and the moats around you? And the last part is because, again, we take client confidence so seriously. Cyber today is a hard game. You know, the thing that scares me most is advanced threats that are highly targeted from sophisticated actors. I want to make their life difficult. I want to make it very hard that even if they get their toe in the door, they can't lateral and go on uh, to the next part of my network. So one of the first things we decided we wanted to do along with dog fooding is looking at immutable infrastructure to help solve some of these problems. So just like we said before, we want to treat our infrastructure code a lot like our application code. Why were we interested in immutable? We're all developers. Immutable infrastructure feels a lot like how you do development. You know, we don't try to patch binaries that we shipped or a jar file that we shipped to an environment. We just have a new version and we ship it out and that's the version that you run. And so for us, this made a lot of sense as we were going cloud native to say, well, rather than having long running machines, let's just replace them. And this is something that, you know, separate talk, but Terraform and Packer made that a lot easier. But we hit three challenges on that. So you probably don't want to bake in the list of who works for you and who's allowed to SSH in your machines. That'd be bad news or really painful to change, especially as you're promoting it through environments. And then obviously the environment-specific configuration, things like secrets, you're probably not going to want to bake that into your machine. And then log records. If you work in, in any kind of industry that has regulatory or governance requirements, you probably need to retain your records for a certain amount of time. Um, and so you can't just throw the machine away. You know, if you're keeping your logs locally, you have to deal with that. Um, so Vault really here came to be the thing that initially we just liked it because, you know, look, it looks like we can keep our secrets. It's an easy way to centralize them. We knew Chef and encrypted data bags and Chef Vault really well. And we were kind of thinking about it that way, like, okay, we'll just do secrets. So the takeaway from this talk is that Vault to us does a lot more than this. And so if you're thinking about using Vault or if you are, you can go a lot further than that. So administrative access for us, we really would love to get to a world where we don't need to run SSHD anymore. We're not there yet. You know, there are still things where we have to get in the machine locally to uh, troubleshoot it. Uh, and so in this case, we're using CoreOS. We like CoreOS because it's minimal. We're just running Docker. That's all we need. I can outsource patch management to Core with their atomic updates. That's great. But it doesn't run PAM. So this is a place where a lot of the traditional moves you would make and saying, well, I'll just bind to LDAP and have all that, you know, just work with my Linux distro didn't really work. But Vault, having so many different options under the hood with this SSH backend uh, would let us say, OK, I can delegate access to the centralized service. We get all the good things if it integrates with our primary identity, it integrates with multi-factor auth that we already have running. Um, and then what's really cool is with the SSH CA backend, we can also do mutual authentication. So now what used to be we would just ignore it every time you had an auto-scaling event and you get a warning about known hosts and say, oh, yeah, it's just auto-scaling. And we're like, we're training ourselves to literally ignore this valid security warning. Like, what if this really isn't one of our machines? And so by doing SSHCA signing of the host certificate, we now know that if we get a warning about saying, I don't know who this machine is, something went wrong. So that's another way we were able to level up the security. 
And then, of course, with Vault, we get all the great things around policies and be able to control who has access to that. The list of policies you see there is 100% driven by a primary identity, which in this case is LDAP, saying what groups are you in, so uh, what roles should you have. And then the great thing is it's all auditable. So now we have all of this because Vault is easy to audit. It's getting sent to a SIM, so we're able to see who did what. The next obvious part, probably not a surprise, mentioned that second challenge about how do we configure our hosts. Console template is awesome. I love it. We're able to put secrets and other configuration settings in Vault and also with console, and it just works. Like, to me, console template has been uh, such a force multiplier for us. Uh, one of the great tools that we love in the HashiCorp stack. When they added EC2 um, instance authentication with Vault, it made our life even easier there. Uh, had one less secret to manage. Uh, and then the next part was how do we configure our actual workloads? So we're, we're really bought in on the Docker containers as a service platform model. And we built a wrapper around this where it feels more like a platform to our developers, really just to give them uh, just efficiency so they're not thinking about lower level problems. And so here, this is a file similar to what we heard with Capital One. It's in their repo. It's a YAML file. And they can just declare what types of secrets do I want. So today, lots of AWS stuff. Uh, we added a back end for Mailgun for people to have ephemeral secrets when you're sending out email, uh, and then dynamic uh, secrets for your app with Postgres. And then we'll add those, uh, you know, as other people re requests come in, we'll add additional backends as well. Uh, we found this to be very accessible to developers to where now that the way that we're handling secrets in our infrastructure as a cloud team is also the same that our developers are using in a PaaS-like uh, way. So it's nice to get that consistency. And then on top of this, we added uh, in our cockpit here, we added a self-service UI to where you could come in and say, you know, these are the secrets I want to change. We had a frequent request coming from developers like, hey, I need to write a new secret. You know, I've got an API key for some third party service. And we realized like in typical uh, consultant fashion, this was low value added work. We weren't doing anything of value by having us write it for them. So with Vault, we were able to do some sophisticated things to do things like write only by policy. You can change them yourself. And then status indicators to say, you know, the things you declared are green. So the things in your YAML file, we see they're green. Or we have things in Vault that are yellow that you have written, but you actually haven't declared that you want us to inject it into your container. All right, so the next interesting part of our journey, encryption key management. So for some companies, this may be a non-issue. Uh, for other regulated ones, this can be a real problem, where uh, as great as things like AWS KMS is, or what Google does with its zero trust and its encryption, uh, we may have fundamental issues about letting that root of trust leave our doors. We still want to own encryption at the root, where we own the root key and nobody else does. And so this is where Vault has paid us quite a bit of dividends. Um, and so we've had different ways we've approached this. Initially, we were told we had to go write our own version of KMS for um, elastic storage. So we had to go do Lux plus Vault and do a lot of complicated things to orchestrate all of that. And fortunately, Amazon came out with something called Bring Your Own Key. So uh, what we're doing now is working on sort of trying to design out what it would look like to add to the AWS secret backend uh, in Vault today to have it to where when I want to generate my own root key with my own entropy in Vault, possibly with something on-prem, possibly with something that's HSM backed, I can do it right with Vault. And the beauty of that is that you know, HSMs are an easy thing for your security team to say, go do. But the interface, the APIs around it are very cumbersome to use. So Vault adds a nice sort of layer on top of that to make it much more developer friendly to where we could say, all right, I just want a new key. Let me call it foo. I'll maintain a record of it in Vault that I know is secure. And then I'll send it off and have Amazon import it. And now I can use it with things like EBS or S3 or other areas. And then secondarily, the other part is we hit some services like RDS. We use RDS Postgres heavily. Um, but that's really hard to tell every individual client that they have their own encryption key. So the Vault Transit backend for apps that have a higher security assurance level, uh, we can tell them go to the Vault Transit backend. It's encryption as a service. There's all the things that uh, Armin mentioned earlier about making it much easier to uh, generate keys and to maintain them and rotate them. So we really have two different ways to approach that problem of how do we make sure that we don't have um, key management issues um, for places that care about things like blind subpoenas against a service provider from a government body um, or having a service provider go bad and having access to your data or durability concerns where maybe the service provider says they're just no longer going to honor your contract, you have to leave, you have all your data, but it's encrypted. How do you decrypt it to bring it to the next place? Uh, the last part, too, I'd say is the takeaway. There we go. Um, is identity management. This was a bit unexpected, uh, but we have a goal to get STS everywhere with AWS. Uh, we got burned by some long-term IAM credentials that ended up in github.com and you know, did some bad things. Um, and so I'm on a mission to just say, look, you know, I don't want to have to worry about what's out there. Let's just have 
just like Vault, a short-term lease. Armin mentioned it earlier. I don't need this forever access. I need it for the next 30 minutes. And so that's easy to do if you think about, OK, I know how to set up federated auth in the console. That's pretty straightforward. And I know how to give my third parties and say, here's the name of my role and a shared password to use when you want to get something, you get fine-grained access to like my S3 bucket or my CloudWatch metrics. That's straightforward. But what do you do when your admins want CLI access to do things like run Terraform plans locally? How do you give them API keys? And so <coughs> amazingly, Amazon hasn't solved this yet. And for us, it was just a simple issue of using the Vault AWS backend and then doing a markdown doc in a wiki that said, just here, take this piece of bash script if you want or modify it however you want for your Z shell or whatever. And then when you call this, as long as you can talk to Vault and you're authenticated with it, it will do all the work of issuing you STS creds fine-grained policies, it's audible, all that. And so I'd say for us, we're really getting to a world where we're having almost zero sort of long-term IAM users. When we get to zero, I'm going to be pretty happy about that. Um, and that's another way that we can sort of increase the security. So here's just an easy example of it. So calling a, a shell function here, and if you wrap it in eval, of course, it'll put it into your environment. Um, it's made it pretty easy to do things like have a sandbox account that you can test out with Terraform locally. Uh, the next part was super excited to see the TOTP backend, not to have developers uh, going and um, calling it directly to Im implement TOTP for their own 2FA, but it's actually the root account. Just like Capital One, we have a lot of AWS accounts at our firm, and it's really funny that like everyone has the same problem of, I know I need to put MFA on my root account, but then I've got like a team of people, and if you're in a geographically distributed company, you know, how do we make sure that at least somebody in the middle of the night can get access to this thing? Um, and I've got some team members where, you know, they will put, um, they'll register a TOT device or a hardware device and throw it in a safe, but you better hope that that time zone's awake when you need it. Um, or two people, you know, each one of them has sort of a blue and green. One person has it, another person has a copy of it. And again, you better hope that you keep that up to date so that when that person quits, you're not down to one. Um, and so here, when they add it to uh, the TOT backend of Vault, I'm like, this is a perfect use case. So we can do a shared password saved out of band somewhere else for root. Um, but now we have a way to say, OK, I have a, a policy that allows a limited number of people to get at the MFA device for the root account. And there are just times you have to use root. If you want to submit a penetration request to AWS, they only <laughs> accept it as root, which is crazy ironic because it's a security function. Um, and then most importantly, it sends to a SIM event. So here's just a small example of me with a sandbox getting a TOTP code here. And then more importantly, uh, with a SIM, shipping that and being able to generate things like alerts that if you see that somebody called the sandbox here, you know, who was it that did that? And so now at least we have a fighting chance to know that not only somebody logged in as root, but probably who was it. And that's a unique thing that I think Vault's uh, interestingly positioned to help solve. Um, so hopefully your, your takeaway from this is that you know, Vault, obviously its core mission of helping to, to contain secrets Vault is really great at that. But I think there's a lot of other ancillary things that helps you really accelerate and go faster as you start to adopt public, public cloud. All right, thanks.